They beat winter with almost no fuel. World War II survival heating secrets that still embarrass modern homes. The cold killed faster than bullets in World War II. That's not drama. That's arithmetic. Calories, wood, time and heat were the real currencies of survival. And here's the uncomfortable truth most modern people don't want to hear. Civilians and soldiers on the Eastern Front routinely survived brutal winters using a fraction of the firewood we burn today. Not because they were tougher. Not because they suffered more. But because they understood heat in a way we've largely forgotten. This isn't nostalgia. This is engineering under pressure. And at the centre of it all was a heating system, so efficient it turns modern fireplaces into a bad joke. Let's get into it. World War II. Winter survival was one with systems, not stockpiles. When World War II dragged into winter, especially in Eastern Europe, fuel scarcity became a life-or-death problem. Rail lines were bombed. Forest access was limited. Cities were cut off. You couldn't just burn more. That luxury didn't exist. What did exist was a survival mindset that treated heat as something you captured, stored and rationed, not something you wasted chasing flames. That's where the old masonry stove enters the conversation a massive brick structure that looks primitive to modern eyes. But that appearance hides something deeply sophisticated. This system routinely delivered all-day heat from a single short fire. Two hours of burning, twenty-four hours of warmth, no exaggeration. That alone explains how families could survive on as little as 10% of the wood a modern household would consume trying to heat the same space. The real genius was heat capture, not firepower. Modern heating, well, it obsesses over flames. Bigger fires, faster burn, more output right now. That thinking is backward. The World War II era masonry stove was built around a different question. Where does the heat go after the fire is out? Instead of letting hot gases rush up a chimney, the stove forced smoke through a long internal maze of horizontal channels. Every turn stripped heat from the exhaust and pressed it into tons of brick and clay. By the time smoke finally exited, it was often cool enough to touch. That mass wasn't decorative. It was a thermal battery. Once charged, it released heat slowly, evenly and relentlessly. No temperature spikes, no cold gaps at night, just steady radiant warmth when people needed it most. For survival, this mattered more than raw temperature. Hypothermia isn't beaten by bursts of heat. It's beaten by consistency. Fuel efficiency in World War II wasn't theoretical. It was enforced by reality. The stove's low horizontal firebox forced flames to linger. Air mixed thoroughly with gases. Wood volatiles burned instead of escaping as smoke. That meant higher internal temperatures, cleaner burns, and dramatically more usable energy per log. Compare that to an open fireplace where most heat disappears up the chimney and you begin to understand the numbers. This wasn't marginally better. It was orders of magnitude better. Modern survivalists recognize this principle instantly. 
It's the same logic behind efficient wood stoves, rocket stoves, and even primitive field techniques like trench fires. Slow the burn. Finish the burn. Waste nothing. In World War II, a rushed fire wasn't just inefficient, it was deadly. Now, here's where historians often, you know, miss the point by focusing only on heating. This stove wasn't just a single-purpose device. It was, in fact, a survival command centre. The top surface, interestingly enough, stayed warm enough to sleep on, turning even the coldest nights into manageable ones without needing any extra fuel. And those internal chambers? They doubled as slow ovens, where meals could cook all day long without any supervision. Shelves and little niches, dried boots, gloves and uniforms that would have otherwise frozen solid overnight. Medical care happened there too, believe it or not. Steady, radiant heat was used to treat illness and prevent infection in conditions where, frankly, modern medicine was simply unavailable. Every unit of heat was, you know, really forced to do multiple jobs. Cooking, heating, drying, sanitation, recovery. This is, well, why fuel consumption dropped so dramatically. There was no waste heat. Every calorie worked over time. That's the lesson most relevant today. Efficiency isn't just about better devices. It's about integration. Thermal mass quietly won the winter. Thin walls lose heat. Period. That was understood long before modern insulation standards. Homes built around these stoves were, you know, compact, well-sealed and heavy. Thick walls were common, along with earth floors and brick partitions. The structure itself actually acted as a heat reservoir. Once it was warm, it tended to stay warm. During World War II, this meant there were fewer fires, less fuel hauling, and, well, lower physical exhaustion. That really mattered when calories were scarce and labour was dangerous. Even today, you can apply this honestly without rebuilding your house. Stone benches near a stove, brick heat walls, or even water containers placed strategically. Anything that absorbs heat during peak output and releases it slowly afterward follows the same principle. Thermal mass buys you time. And, well, time is survival. The stove reveals how people really survived World War II winters. There's a dangerous myth that people in the past simply suffered more, that they endured cold through grit alone. That's lazy history. What they actually did was engineer their environment with brutal efficiency. They eliminated waste. They designed systems where failure wasn't an option. And, you know, they respected energy as a finite resource. The stove represents that mindset perfectly. It wasn't romantic, it was necessary, and, well, it worked. When fuel deliveries stopped and forests were stripped, this system kept people alive. When armies froze in the field, similar principles were used in shelters and dugouts. Heat captured. Heat stored. Heat rationed. That's how winter was beaten. Not with abundance. With intelligence. Now, 
How can we, as modern viewers, actually apply these lessons without, you know, needing to rebuild history from scratch? Well, the good news is, you don't need a five-ton brick stove to learn from this. Burn smaller, hotter fires and, you know, stop chasing flames all day. Add thermal mass wherever you can. Design heat sources to perform multiple roles. Cook where you heat. Dry where you cook. Sleep where the warmth lingers longest. Most importantly, stop thinking about heat as something you generate continuously. Instead, think of it as something you charge and release. That mental shift alone can, honestly, cut fuel use dramatically. World War II survivors didn't have efficiency charts or sustainability podcasts. They had cold, hunger, and, well, no margin for error. And they solved the problem anyway. That's the kind of knowledge worth preserving. If this deep dive into real applied World War II survival technology added something new to your understanding, you're exactly who this channel is for. Subscribe to History HQ, share this with someone who actually cares about how history worked, and help keep these lessons alive. Because survival isn't about gear. It's about understanding the systems that kept people alive when failure wasn't an option.